Hello, and welcome to the Transforming Loneliness interview series. I'm Laura Parker, the creator and host of the series. Transforming Loneliness approaches loneliness with fresh and unexpected ways of seeing and responding that cultivate connection, belonging, and love. Today, I'm very happy to be with Bio Akomalafe. Bio Akomalafe, PhD, changes diapers, loves ghee dosas and coconut chutney, and is slowly learning how to play with his four-year-old daughter, Alethea. He is the grateful life partner of Ijioma, author of These Wilds Beyond Our Fences, Letters to My Daughter on Humanity's Search for Home, and chief curator of the Emergence Network, a post-activism project concerned with the material performativity of responsivity in precarious times. What I love about Bio is the way his writing challenges and expands our views of what humanity is and what reality is and how they co-create each other and dance together. And this is such an important narrative at this time that we're in on the earth. So thank you so much, Bio, for joining me today. Mm, thank you so much for having me, Laura. So Bio, um, we'll just jump right in here. Uh, one of your favorite topics, I believe, about modernity. Uh, mm. How does modernity produce and condition loneliness? Right. Um, well, in answering that question, I might, I might just uh, look for an entry point that isn't entirely clinical or psychological. Um, since <laughs> since the, the notion of the psychological is expanding um, and has always been expanding. Um, but first, I think a few things about modernity. And modernity is the rush for resolution. It's the uh, quest for final um, is the is the fight is the quest to name things in a final way to say this is what you are and there's nothing else to come or um, if you're this identity then it's essential to you so it's an attempt to categorize and index with language the entire world and to do so in a way that um, that is authoritative and um, yeah, powerful and, and yeah, the word final comes to mind again. Um, thinking of modernity, it seems to be framed by certain practices and um, especially the enlightenment ideology, which assumes and takes for granted um, our separability, which is basically um, for persons that are stumbling onto that word for the first time, the notion that we are separate from each other. And I'm an integrated, coherent, um, complete and absolute self, other to you and other to the environment. Um, I'm a unit, I'm a phenomenological unit. I am separate and if you want to know exactly what I am, you have to come to me and if possible, tear me apart to get to the essential core <laughs> that is inside of me, that tells you who I am. And that ideology of separability is of course um, part of a larger structure. The larger structure that has the nation state, that has um, um, global capitalism and shareholder capitalism as part of that structure and is and is yeah founded or premised on this very central notion of separability uh, that of course arranges the world in very very um, particular material and social arrangements um, if we take for granted or we start from the idea that we're separate, we will perform separability. 
And in performing separability, we build structures. We build our education system. We notice things um, in our economic systems that only buttress or reinforce the idea that Laura is entirely separate from bio and there is no entanglement or there's no contiguity between us. Um, so in a sense, modernity is the earthly machine, the, the machine that produces this affect, the affect of loneliness, um, the, uh, the feeling, uh, uh, which might throw people off a bit. I'll, I'll say another thing about that, that loneliness is not just a feeling. Loneliness is physical. It's not just physical, it's a concept. It's, the, it's material, it's semiotic, it's spiritual, it's social, it's cosmic, basically. It's literally the, the integration, if you will, and I don't mean that in a final way, in the way that uh, our modern forebears might think about it, but it is the product of a congregation of forces. Um, an intersection of beings and agencies. Um, so lonely, loneliness is like a public event. <laughs> it's not a private affair. It's, it's what the manifold is doing. It is, if I could tease loneliness apart, it would be fractured. And not in a final way, again, I have to repeat this, that it is not some inherently coherent concept. Like that is what loneliness looks like. Loneliness, like everything in the world, is changing. It is, it is a becoming, if you will. Uh, to situate it in our society right now, how we experience loneliness is probably in our detachment from others, um, our, how we produce and construct hope about the future, how we think about the past, the present, and the future, time being linear, so we are estranged from our ancestors because we are being conditioned to think of them as part of a past that is done and done with. Um, so it, it's this estrangement, this perpetual estrangement from community, from, uh, from the mutuality, the strange magical mutuality of happiness and sadness, of grief and gratitude. Um, it, is, it is the search for resolution. It is the public and cosmic and spiritual product that predisposes us to think in terms of resolution, in terms of privacy, in terms of essentialism. Um, so, um, and if that seems too abstract, um, loneliness is... Loneliness is what, is what it feels like to turn away from the community that is always near, a community of non-human and human presences and bodies that are already a part of us. But it's the education of denying that and focusing instead on something that isn't um, helpful or useful to us. Yes, it, it, when you, the last thing you just said about yeah. loneliness is turning away from the community that is or what it feels like to turn away from the community that's always there. Right. Uh, it seems like inherent in that is, is a lie, like the lie that who I am is what exists inside my skin. Right. And that also that the location of my problem and the location of the solution to that problem exists inside my skin. And somehow right. I have to turn inside to find the answer or as you said the the final solution right right it's it, it in a way that that's that's very that resonates because um i see loneliness as a special and i want to situate it and ground it in the specificity of our conversation about this modernity late capitalism late stage capitalism um yes it seems to be the performance of an estranged self the self in a straight jacket. So we perform it, it's our performance. And that performance is ongoing. Um, would I call it a lie though? Excuse me, uh, can you say a little for our listeners who may not have heard that word used that way, the word performance? Okay. Can you just right. say a little bit about that? 
Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I use performance or performativity in the in in the sense of I'm trying to signal something that is a process that is ongoing, and that already assumes or take for granted or takes for granted the idea that the world is relational, a relationship, that the world isn't made up of things, as Laura, you and I are intuiting and learning about. It's not made up of things, it's made up of relationships. And it's only in the context of those relationships that things emerge, but only as um, relationship products, if you will. So light is not a thing. If you're trying to, if you're trying to define light, for instance, this is just an instance, an example, you will never find the final answer um, because light is a relationship. So that's the sense in which I, I, I think about um, performance, that the world is a practice, an ongoing negotiation and meeting of beings. Um, so the what was the question again? The previous oh, the, what were we with? oh dear, um, I don't remember. <laughs> no, oh, uh, uh, you, you said this is what I wanted to respond to the idea that um, the lie, you know, that it's a yeah. lie. I would I would even say that lies because if we if we are in a really material relation uh, relational universe, then even lies are real. Even lies are certain specific kinds of relationalities with the world um, so yes in a sense we are performing a lie we're performing the idea that we are private selves and the universe is um sorry if you hear any noise viewers everyone it's my five-year-old daughter in the background um, and we're performing the idea that we are that we are integrated and we're separate from each other so that in a sense is what I mean by performance. Okay, yeah. right. And then you wanted to, you wanted to talk about uh, the lie of separability, or and yes. even as you're saying it, yes, I agree with you that even the idea of a lie is something that is performed. Yes, 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 yeah. So it, it, um, it's it's um, it seems to be the stickiest notion yet that that. What it means to be a self is to be localized in, you know, is to be localized between my skin. And, and that is all there is to know about me, you know. Um, but I think the mystical traditions of our modern times, which is ironic, quantum physics um, is, is contesting that lie. It's basically saying the self isn't localized between your skin. It is it is large and it's, it's a contradiction. It's spread out across the environment. So what makes Laura, Laura is, is, a, is a haptic <laughs> involution and confluence of ancestors and, and stardust and plants and non-humans and beings that we will never come to the bottom of um, so that aloneness is impossible. But loneliness is a performance of our of the of our rejection of that premise of entanglement right and so um i'm curious i i, I know that uh, that there aren't solutions to this but still <laughs> still of course i guess being a human who is shaped by modernity i i i and i imagine our listeners also want to know oh, what can we do about this you know and how can we and i i think some of the answers are something like instead of turning away from this turn find a way to turn toward it like to turn toward the fact yeah. that that humans are stardust and ancestors um and plants you know that we are we're a confluence of all of these in any one moment mm. and and then the question becomes how do we turn toward that uh, mm. and i'm just curious if you might share how do you do it like what is your way of walking through the world that tries to perform um this being a being a confluence being a um, a, 
a, an intersection of of all of these things at any one moment. Right, right. Um, here's the thing, Laura. I think in a, in a way, um, even asking the question, what can I do about it, um, is is a performance of that. It's it's only made possible by our modern conditions, right? I agree. It, and that's not to deny that that like a rhizome, it could it couldn't lead to other places. Asking the question could lead to emancipatory practices, thoughts and theories and possibilities. It could open up new ways of being. But I want to acknowledge that the question is only made meaningful and made possible because we are, we are being produced by a world that signals us, the selves, the human selves, as the focal point of all agency. So basically, it's, it's, it's like it has to be reducible. Um, what can be done about that has to be reducible to what we can do about it, that what human beings have to say about it. Um, and in a beautiful way, we are learning, I think, that not everything is resolvable. There is no final resolution, especially in our power. There's a people in Australia, I think they're called the Ulu people, and it's a colleague of mine, Vanessa Andriotti, that told me about this, and I want to just acknowledge that. She met with these people, and they told her that they are, there are 99 senses that we are brought up in this world thinking we have only five senses. Um, but we have more than 99 senses. Uh, and I think what they're trying to say is beyond 99, it, they're not trying to say we have specifically 99, but we have much more than 99 senses. And meaning making or making sense of the world is just one of them just one of them. There are other senses that have nothing to do with understanding or activism or resolution or, you know, all of that. And I like that because it, it humbles me. It, it brings me to a place of noticing that what I have to say and do about it is not all there is that can be said about it or that can be noticed about it. But there's another strand I want to address in, about that. I think we are in very, very dire times, troublesome times, that the very idea of being human is being composted. And as we are being composted, I think as we are melting into the ground, certain kinds of rituals and possibilities and practices become shimmery, brilliant, inviting. Um, I like to, I like to uh, frame this as post-activism or within the larger context of making sanctuary. And, and the idea here is that we've been told, for instance, to think outside the box. That's a very modern thing to say, to think outside the box, because it presumes that uh, we are separate from the boxes that contain us. Um, I feel that the need today is to touch the boxes is to meet the colonial boxes, is to meet the monsters, is to touch the large expanse of ourselves, of our material bodies. For instance, and this is taking the subject away from loneliness just for a little while, to identity. Um, you're white, Laura, or, or modernity would want me to categorize you as white and to tick the box and say, that's what you are. <laughs> but. Uh, identity isn't so simple or convenient. I mean, DNA ancestral uh, testing is showing that, you know, our bodies are doing something quite different than the boxes we tick would allow us to believe. So we're spread out, we're diffracted, much more than those simple identities are present, um, even in smaller doses, but smaller consequential doses that queers the idea that I am black in a final way and you're white in some kind of estranged final way. It's the same thing with loneliness, I think. The world produces it. We, in partnership and alliance with the world, we're producing loneliness. And the loneliness is, in turn, shaping us. So 
but I think today, as our cells spread out and spill out of our bodies, we can come to touch it. We can come to places where we notice our demise. Let me give you an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. For instance, I just finished a retreat, and part of that retreat was to invite people to, to meet the material world, um, the environment, in a very strange way, to hack the way, um, the ways that they usually approach things. So people went to trees and spoke with them, which might seem a weird thing to do in such urgent times. They spoke with the trees. Um, some people spoke with their mailboxes. Some people sat with the, in the corner of their room and just stared at the corner. It might seem like uh, woo-woo stuff, but basically what we're doing was reconstructing their relationships with the world outside of them and noticing that the world is alive in ways that we don't know how to notice yet. Another example of a thing that we could do is, and this is just throwing examples around, is feet washing. I like the idea of washing each other's feet, finding a way to signal our collective demise. Because as we wash our feet, our cells go into the water and we're basically signaling a radical kind of hospitality. So I don't want to speak too much on this, but basically to say that there are certain ways we can approach our collective demising, uh, our, did I say demising? <laughs> that seems like a good word. Our collective dying, our fragility, our entanglement, and ways we can concretize that in ritual and practice. Mm. And so I love that, that what you're saying is that they were practicing or performing uh, yes. a different kind of relationality with yes. things than that what we would normally do. And yes. to bring it back to loneliness, like um, yes. earlier, earlier you said that, um, that oh, a, a mistake of of modernity is that humans think that they are the focal point of all agency and yes. that if you're actually talking to a tree what you're acknowledging is the agency that exists in the tree or yes. perhaps the agency that exists in water when you're yes. washing your feet and i propose that we can talk to loneliness that yes. it, loneliness has an agency and that yes. it's the presence that we can interact with in a creative and generative way that, that shifts the idea that, oh, I'm the master of my universe and somehow I just have to get rid of loneliness. Right, right, yeah. right. So, so it's, it's the fantasy of flight, right? That's, again, modernity. That we can leave things behind. And you probably have heard of the transhumanist movement that says one day down the line, if we're good with our technology, we can get rid of loneliness, every form of negative emotion in a once and for all way. We can just get rid of it because we would have become, we would have been part of the technological singularity and our bodies would be transcendent and then loneliness wouldn't matter after all because we'll be connected to some hybrid self. And I think that's, uh, I wanna have compassion you know, when I hear things like that and notice exactly what's happening there, that there's a yearning for connectivity, a yearning for meeting other bodies to kind of sidestep the prison houses that we've been confined in for so long by this modern project. And so you say it beautifully, meeting the monstrosity of loneliness. And that could come in any kind of creative expression that may be rooted to some indigenous tradition. The way I do it, is um, to meet family, to meet my books and my journaling, and to actually speak with my loneliness, if you will, to address it, to give it a name, and to write to it. That's not supposedly, that's not supposed to resolve it or solve the problem, but it creates linkages, it creates the thread of connectivity between me and the thing that exceeds me, so to speak and that is already a part of my being. So instead of trying to chuck it out or to uh, heal ourselves, which is the reason why I really celebrate your, your use of the word, of the phrase transforming loneliness. So instead of trying to 
push it away and make it a bad thing we can get rid of. Let's try to meet it instead um, and see what happens. Yes, and so that's a wonderful invitation. And I think in, it's easy to say and hard to do. You know, yeah. oh, let's just turn towards the monster. Yeah, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, <laughs> true, except meeting monsters is never an easy thing. If you can make it a prototype, if you can prototype your approach to a monster, then you haven't really met a monster. You've met an icon or a meme or something. Um, so it's, a diff it's the difficult work. And I think in when I talk about hogging monsters, for instance, I'm signaling the difficult and hard work of tearing down ourselves, basically, um, which, is, <laughs> which is of noticing our own monstrosity, because that's the agency of the monster. That's the gift and the sacred work of the monster. The monster tears us apart and says, notice, you're not as whole as you think. Um, there's, there's a goddess in India whose name is Akilandeshwari. And Akilandeshwari's name literally translates the one who is never not broken. Never not broken. I started out by saying loneliness is the search for resolution, is the search for wholeness. And um, nature, I feel, abhors wholeness. Nature is the deconstruction of itself. It's constantly breaking down itself and experimenting as we are experimenting now. Um, it's always sympathetic to the next. Um, Akilandeshwari, like other deities and other Orishas and other uh, mythological beings, are storied presences that teach us that we are porous and we should explore our porosity. Um, so loneliness itself, you know, is a monster that if we dwell with, might teach us that we're not as alone, contained, or allow me to just make up a word here, integritas, <laughs> as we might imagine ourselves to be. Um, and that the world around us is constantly refashioning us. I mean, our, my phone, um, the, my table, things around me are always making me, as they are making you. Um, we are, our bodies are shaped by our laptops, by our chairs, by the, by the stairwell, by our buildings, so that it is impossible to extricate what it means to be human from the environment that makes the conditions for humanity to be, to be possible. So, um, yeah, I think the approach here is to, is to find creative embedded ways of meeting loneliness of meeting our aloneness, if you will. And I could share lots of other, I mean, a lot of examples about how that could happen. Would you, perhaps you could just share one. Okay. Um, well, I spoke about, I spoke about feet washing um, and an exercise that I call it the trail of enlivenment. Um, there's something that is done up north in India. Um, where people are invited to sit with each other in, in a circle and share their feelings, their negative emotions. So I have to pre uh, premise this by saying that one of the things that, that makes loneliness really unbearable is the idea that feelings are internal. And the, the psychiatrist or the psychologist, the shrink has to be within. So we have memes on the internet that say, for instance, be the self you want to be, or, or be the self you seek to, how, how does it go again, Laura? It's a Gandhian phrase, oh, supposedly a Gandhian the phrase. Change you wish to see. Ah, there you go, there you go. You know it better than I do. Yeah. Be the change you wish to see in the world. And that might seem innocent enough, but it's also the invitation to get yourself aligned when you're aligned and good on the inside, then the world outside will naturally follow, you know, it will be in some deterministic fashion, it will follow after the alignment within. And that's still the idea that the self is within, the soul, so to speak, is within. But what would change if the infrastructure of the human person, of personhood, were to be shattered com completely? And we notice that feelings are private events hate 
jealousy, those things that we'll rather do away with, shame, uh, are public events, I said private, are public events and communal events that just the experience of loneliness calls on the community, is a communal gesture. What would change if we share that amongst ourselves? So this ritual that I've been part of um, up north in India, I'm in the south of India right now, invites people to sit together and share jealousy, you know, uh, or share, <laughs> or just with withness. I, don't, I want to call it withnessing, not witness, but to withness. To, what does it mean to witness jealousy or witness hate? To bring it like an offering, like the way people in India um, share pox, chicken pox, for instance, come to eat, come to their houses and say, "Please, I like some some of the you, the pox your child has for my own child," and they take a little bit and they rub it on their child, and it's just a <laughs> a storied community of infection. What would it be like if we noticed that our feelings are infectious and we can share them? Um, I think that would, that would hack into the machine of loneliness, the machine that produces the idea that I'm estranged from you. That's just one example. They sit together, they wash each other's feet, um, and then they share jealousy, they share hate, even jealousy among each other in, in a community, in a group. Like I felt this way among you, and there's no judgment there's no uh, morality, there's no moralizing it. It's just the sharing and the noticing of it. And something powerful always happens. Right, and there's no happens. problem solving. <laughs> no, it's not a problem solving, it's not shrinking, it's not uh, uh, advice. It's just witnessing it, like just being present to notice my implication in intimate webs of suffering that I will never be able to language or index in a final way. And in doing that, we kind of talk to the heart of loneliness. Again, I don't want to give the idea that there's some essence of loneliness that we need to attack here, but, but that loneliness emerges from the ways we relate with the world, the ways we relate with our feelings, the ways we relate to time and space. And so if we notice these things and hack these things, and respond to them um, in a way in a way that is difficult for me to characterize with examples right now. Um, I feel that we can address um, some of the conceit of modernity. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful example, Bio. I love what you said that actually you bring it like an offering. Yes, so you bring your not, and I I've been trying to to take out any, all of the writing that I've been doing about loneliness, there's a tendency to use the word your loneliness or my loneliness. And I've been trying to take the word your or my out anytime I see it and just yeah. say loneliness. So, yeah. but it creeps in the tendency to say your or my, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and just to, just to say, here it is. And yeah. I, I could imagine perhaps hosting such an event and mm. how it would how much courage it would take for anyone to show up when mm. when we have the belief that that loneliness is really something shameful and it's a failure and it's personal yes. you know yes. Yes. so it's subversive just to come just to show up at the event Yes, yes. And you know, it's not new at all. This is not, well, it's new and old in the sense that everything is new and old because the world is changing and a co-becoming, a constant becoming. But um, in, my, in my native, uh, where I come from in Nigeria, in the west of Nigeria, um, grief, for instance, is public. It's a shared event. You know, there's this tendency in, in as modern, as citizens just stating in this modern project to overstate the, the, the uh, implications of psychological events. It's this thing that they call psychologism. So basically, just like you said, it's your loneliness, it's your grief, it's your failure, it's your refusal to do the right thing, to put yourself together. And this is what also uh, creates the affect of loneliness. Um, but where I come from, when someone dies, grief is shared. And I don't mean in terms of I'm, I feel sad 
I feel, I mean, it's performed. There's a communal performance of grieving. My father died when I was 15, and I remember us driving to the village to bury him. He was considered a great man, and so um, he drew lots of people. But I was schooled in, in the city. I, I schooled in the city like most kids growing up, or some kids growing up in Nigeria today. And I remember um, feeling irritated when I saw market women tearing out their hair or chasing the convoy vehicles. And I said, they didn't know my dad. Why are they, why are they pretending? I didn't understand it then. But I said, why are they pretending? And my anger was even, you know, I even got even angrier when I heard that some of these women were paid, were paid to grieve. And I felt it was all fake. I didn't really get the idea that um, whether it was paid or not wasn't, is, isn't particularly useful to my analysis here. It's the idea that I can actually invite someone to perform grieving with me, mm. and that we grieve together. It's not your grief versus my grief or your happiness or your self-actualization uh, versus my self-actualization. It's the idea that it is all of us in this together. Mm. This is the embodiment, the materialization of Ubuntu, the African philosophy that I am you and you are me. We're implicated in each other. Yeah. So as you were talking, um, I was thinking about, okay, so the performance of grief has to do with wailing and tearing your hair out and all that. And the performance of loneliness would probably look very different. It would be a certain kind of implosion <laughs> the, let, let, let's go, let's call it the performance of of sticky loneliness or or communal loneliness, which kind of is oxymoronic. But but the idea that Laura's loneliness is my loneliness um, already makes it a very transgressive field. And to be in that space, maybe we cannot speak about it at a distance. Maybe we need to be in a space where we invite that to happen to see and notice what happens or what is engendered or what is produced. But yes, in some ways, um, I've seen it happen in the ways people share their feelings in the way people, in, in the way people, in the ways that people grieve together or notice a togetherness in their so-called separability. And, and yeah, in just the sharing of that, it's, it's a powerful thing to notice. And it kind of deconstructs and composts loneliness, transforms it to something. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you, Bio. And I, I think we're coming to a, to a place where we'll need to bring this to a close. And right. so I just wanted to ask you, is there just, you know, given everything that we've talked about, is there anything else that you want to say before we finish? <sighs> hmm. Well, I'll say two things, and they are things that I've that I've I share everywhere I go to, or speak, you know, speak, or the people that I speak with around the world, and it comes from my continent. That the times are urgent. Let us slow down. Um, I won't dwell on that. That feels already. Uh, I hope that resonates with people, and I hope you dwell with that a little while longer. Um, but this is what I want to focus on. It's, it's what a Yoruba healer said to me. And I think it has a lot of bearing on how we perform loneliness. Um, he said that you have chased away the spirits, the agencies, the non-human beings. You've chased away all these other presences uh, because of your road projects and your city building and the noise coming out from your cars. You've chased them away. Now they're in the forest and they're hiding behind trees and they're shy because they don't know how to approach you any longer and they don't know how to be approached any longer. So in order to find your way, and this is what he said, in order to find your way, you must become lost. You must become thoroughly lost. Um, this goes back to what I said in the beginning about loneliness being an effective performance of resolution. It's how we want to be whole, but in trying to be whole, 
the cost of trying to be whole in a final way is that we push out community. And community is the performance of brokenness. Yeah, it's the noticing of our mutuality and porousness. And community doesn't happen unless there are broken walls that brings people together to fix it, right? Or to stay with that. Um, so we are trying to perform wholeness. And we're also trying to perform foundness, I would call it. Um, we need to become lost, is what I would say. We need to find ways of becoming lost, of losing our way, of noticing each other, of hacking the ways we relate with each other. Um, yeah, and that's the creative in invitation of our times, I feel. Thank you so much. I love that. Um, that community is the performance of brokenness. And there's a lot there to contemplate um, about. So thank you for the richness of, of your words and the, of your invitation, Bio. Um, thank you, Lauren. Yeah. And would, is there anything you'd like our, uh, our listeners to know about how they can find you and how they can work with you? Um, I would speak about that in two ways. <laughs> uh, but the easier and surface simple thing to say is that I'm, if you type my name in Google, you can, you'll probably arrive at my website, um, which is just my name with .net after it. And um, yeah, that's why I publish where I'm going or the things I'm doing or the books I'm writing or the people that I'm involved with at the time. But there is another way to actually connect with me. But you do it at the risk of connecting with everything else. And that is, <laughs> and that is to stay with the trouble. Stay with the trouble of the things that you're invited to not to disclose, to actually invite it to be disclosed, to be shared. The secrets, the things you push away, bring them to the open. They are the monsters that want to be seen. And in doing that, we are, we are connecting in a sphere that I'm already a part of, wow. the, the indigenous internet. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's so true. And thank you so much for spending this time with me today. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you.